guess we're not cut off. That's reasonable. Okay. So again, um, this is survey course, so we go kind of whirlwind. Um, we might talk about celestial navigation, which was basically the reason you would learn astronomy for about 500 to 1,000 or maybe even more years in 10 minutes. Um, and we'll talk about um, ways of pointing, basically, and how to locate stuff on the sky. And they're really amateurs, professionals, and everywhere in between. They're really like three ways of locating stuff on the sky. Um, and it depends on what your job and your goal is. So what we're going to talk about is, and all of this is in um, chapter two, chapter three, we'll talk about the history stuff starting on Friday. Um, So this is all really just classical astronomy. Friday, exercise one is due. Um, any questions on exercise two, which will be ne due next Friday, and then we'll start um, we'll start doing history and how people like weave this whole story about why they see what they see into a full coherent cosmology. So again, I don't know, it's the fourth or fifth time you've seen this slide. We're definitely here. Was that Friday? Sixth. Oh, you guys are keeping count. Awesome. Thank you. Um, sixth. Good. So I think we get up to like 20 or so. Okay. So today uh, we're going to stop and just make sure that nobody is really confused about the difference in between what we see and what's actually happening, even though we'll go back and talk about the history of it. So I'll figure out how the apparent motions of the sky are actually caused. Just, again, make sure there's absolutely no confusion. And then um, we'll learn these three ways of locating stuff on the sky. Constellations, this idea of painting an equivalent system that's kind of like latitude and longitude is on the Earth in the sky. So basically celestial latitude and celestial longitude. And then finally, if you're an amateur, you're just somebody in a dark room in a planetarium, which might happen later in the quarter, is just how to point based on your own body is like a, the center of the universe, so local coordinates. And the reason this helps us is, one, it gets us, um, it lets us talk about the direction component of velocities, how we point at stuff in space, and you can use any of these three systems. Um, and then, of course, you know, the why things appear to move the way they appear to move, that's just basic scientific literacy. Okay, and we'll start with that. So this is a picture, and it's a picture that just so happened to be taken in Peru, so that's the southern sky. Um, What's actually going on in this picture? What's the Earth doing to make this beautiful swirly pattern? So it appears as though the wheel of the heavens with all these crystal spheres on it or crystal uh, jewels is spinning over our head once every 24 hours. But of course, that's not what's actually going on. What's actually going on is what? Twirling. So Earth itself is spinning around. And you know you should stop for a second and marvel about the fact that it really isn't that obvious that the Earth is the thing that's rotating, right? So if you were to, you know, you could find the size of the Earth, people figured that out a really long time ago, and we know how long 24 hours is, and you start dividing numbers to find speeds, and you get this number that we're, like, moving in Seattle, at least, at 800 or 900 kilometers per hour. It's pretty fast, right? So that's like riding in a jet plane with the top down. So why don't you feel this is a really important question. So, you know, we are the thing that's moving. Um, and just to show the apparent motions once and point you guys to the um, University of Nebraska simulations, they're actually really good. This is both of those things. So this is a human being, and they happen to be, it by default starts you in basically Nebraska, because they're the people who wrote this. And these are the two depictions of what's going on. So if you're like an alien's eye view, and you're just sitting there watching Earth over the course of a couple of days, this is what you're seeing, and you know maybe your friend sitting in Nebraska has a laser pointer and is flashing to you to let you know where he is. And this is your friend in Nebraska who's just observing the local motions of the sky. So we can start an animation, and what you'll see is really slowly the point in Nebraska starts spinning around. Okay, so the... Let's zoom in a little bit. And this really isn't that helpful, so let's add some star patterns. So it's a pretty equatorial and a southern and a northern constellation and then let's get some some random stars okay so sphere of stars 
this is going to be this fictitious um, thing that we refer to, the celestial sphere. All of the stars are not painted on this um, kind of invisible sphere at some fixed distance. It just seems like that, that way because they're all really far away. So Earth rotating, and you appear to see them move overhead. And this, this point right there, that's the North Star, and that appears to be fixed. The reason it appears to be fixed is that it's the one that's located right underneath Earth's axis. And if I were to put on some trails, what you'll see is you make a picture essentially exactly like the one that you guys saw. So now you can see the trails left behind by these stars, and they all seem to be ascribing circles around the North Star. So basically all of these circles are surrounding, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, the North Star. And total bummer for Southern Hemisphere navigators, there's no bright star that's equivalently located at the South Celestial Pole. So this is you know, the apparent motion and the actual motion. And now I can start asking questions like this. Um, I can actually drag and move this dot, which is a really cheap and fast way of traveling. If I put my fictitious observer at the North pole, what would they see? So what would all the star trails appear to be doing? Yeah, right. Would any star set or rise if I was located at the North Pole? Not a single one, at least over the course of a day. So let's do that. Gotta wait for them to show up again. Let's actually do it manually. <laughs> so hard to catch. So let's just put this guy at north. Okay. So now we're at the North Pole. Still not wearing a jacket. And all of these circles are just directly overhead. Not a single star appears to set or rise. You can see half of Orion. Orion, again, is pretty equatorial. Um, is above and half is below what we'll eventually call this person's horizon, so their personal horizon. OK, let's say I go to the equator. What would I see? What would all of the star trails appear to be doing? Yeah, so stated another way, is there any star that would remain above the horizon for 24 hours? Would every single star rise and set? How long would it take every single star to rise and set? 12 hours up, 12 hours down. Okay. So now we're somewhere on the equator, and this is what the sky trails look like to you. And you get a sense of how you might be able to start the problem, and half of it's easy, easy. Half of it's not so easy. Is You can get a sense of what latitude you're at based on the apparent motions of the stars that you see. So if everything's spinning directly overhead, you know you're at the North Pole, especially if you see Polaris. And then if everything's rising and setting, you know you're at the equator. And then the apparent height of that fixed point above the horizon would basically just tell you your latitude. So as Polaris gets higher and higher and higher in the sky, you're actually at a higher and higher and higher latitude. So that's half of celestial navigation, actually. But never forget that you know these are caused by the actual motion of you on Earth. OK. OK. So we're going to start the problem of pointing at stuff in space. And there are really three ways of doing it. So this is how you navigate around you know, the, the, um, the universe from Earth, at least. And what we'd like to do is be able to point at stuff. So something really interesting is happening out in space. Where is it located? And the first thing to do, and I kind of warned you about this last week, is that um, which one of these is a constellation? So you were able to say constellation, and you guys knew what each other meant. And as of a minute and a half from now, you will be responsible for the, math, uh, the astronomer's formal definition of what a constellation actually is. So what is the constellation Orion? Is it this particular collection of bright stars? Is it the stick figure that they make, those green lines? Or is it this beautiful picture, which, you know, here's another one, right? So he doesn't have a lion skin. Now he's turned backwards and holding a club. Right? So which one is it, or none of the above? 
what? Mm -hmm. So absolutely true. So you can, you know, somebody might think that this is the set of stars is the constellation. Somebody might think the picture. Somebody might think the stick figure. But the, you know, go to an astronomy department and you say something happened in the constellation Orion. They're going to have a precise meaning for that. And it's kind of none of the above. And the most helpful thing to do would be have a definition of a region of the sky that kind of functions the way that if, for instance, you say, I was in Texas over my spring break. I don't know why you would do that. but um, People know where you are, right? And it's actually almost like a geographic, in the case of the states, boundary that lets you know precisely that you are within some region or outside of some region. So, you know, they could have picked a different word, but I think constellation is good enough. The modern definition of constellation is a particular area of the sky with a set of fixed boundaries. And those fixed boundaries were picked in a bunch of conferences that finished in 1930, so they're basically completely arbitrary. But what they tried to do is preserve the historical and cultural meanings of these things um, in the sense that, you know, Orion which is now officially what Orion is, is everything inside of this yellow dotted line. And you can see Orion is particularly complex, right? But they tried to do it in such a way that they preserved what people used to think Orion is. And there's a rough correspondence in between this and this and that, the stuff inside the yellow line. So formally, what the stick figure is and the picture associated with it, those are what are called asterisms, which is sky picture or something like that. But now what constellation means is an area of the sky. And it was done in such a way, again, to kind of preserve the historical meanings. And secondly, so that you can do this. So this is the so-called celestial sphere thing. This is an actual representation. And again, it's fictitious. All the stars are at different distances, but we really can't tell that, at least um, you know, just from Earth without really um, really powerful telescopes. So everything appears to be um, same distance away. And it would be really convenient if I could break these up into a whole bunch of sections. So really what people did is something not much different than this, is I draw a chunk there, and then I draw another chunk there. And I'll cut out the ones that make obvious star pictures just as a starting point. And I cut this thing up into a whole bunch of different sections. So it's as if I, you know, you could even think about taking a razor blade and cutting this into pieces, and then those pieces essentially make like a puzzle that tiles together the entire sky. And there are 88 of them. I don't know why that number was chosen. It could have consolidated a few of the ones in the southern hemisphere, I think. But every point in the sky is uniquely in one constellation. So this section of asterisms that you see, and this is stuff that's up in winter, you can tell. This entire region would be Canis Major, this entire region would be uh, Lepus, and that region would be Orion. So this is method one. And this method will work pretty well for things that are really bright and really obvious. So for instance, there was a nearby supernova, and it was you know, brighter than any other star in the sky. You would be able to tell somebody where it was simply by saying, like, there's a supernova in Orion, and it's visible with the naked eye. So a person would look in Orion, and they would see, like, holy crap, there's a new star there. So this works for things that are either really obvious, you know, there's only one in the entire constellation, or really bright. Or you just have to locate them really roughly. Like, I'd like to know when it was up and when it was down. Okay. So questions about that? Yeah, which points are in which boundary. So that's what would be hard to do. And there is something, um, there are resources for it, is if you wanted to know exactly like how to draw all of these lines. Um, that was the old way of doing it. What you can do now is you can go, and there's many, many apps that you could just like point to a point on the sky, or you could um, put in the equivalent of space latitude and space longitude, which is what we'll get to next, method two. And it'll spit out what constellation you're in. So it'll basically, you point to a place on the sky, and it'll spit out the constellation in which that point is located. Right. So for instance, what I can say is um, Voyager 1 was sent out into space in 1977, or Pioneer uh, Voyager 1, I think, is the one going towards Canis Major. They sent it towards this really bright star, Sirius. 
is about like 12 light hours away at this point, is I can say it's in the direction of Canis Major. So if I wanted to take a big radio telescope and try to see you know, what it's broadcasting, I would point it in Canis Major. And that's good. So it's like rough distances, or sorry, rough positions can be specified by constellation. But constellation is now sky region. And people got together and they agreed upon this. And you can actually see one of the sort of snotty things they did here. So this is the constellation Ophiuchus. And they dipped the foot of Ophiuchus formally and officially into the zodiac to make a 13th zodiac sign. I think it was done out of spite, but what do I know? I wasn't there. So yeah, Voyager 2, you would say it's in Canis Major, which, what does that mean? You know, the constellation is a collection of stars. It means it's in that region of sky. Okay. Okay, so also don't forget that this is totally fictitious. It's a really good fiction if you're sitting there from Earth and you don't have methods to find distances to different stars. But what's really going on is, again, this, you know, this sphere of the sky doesn't really exist. And all of the stars in Orion, for instance, are at wildly different distances. They go in between maybe like 200 light years for the closer stars in the, uh, I think the right shoulder is pretty close. And then uh, Epsilon Arianus is what we're uh, what we'll eventually call it, this far star in the belt. This thing is almost a thousand light years away. It's a f factor of five different in some cases. So, okay. The, yeah. Yes, in the sense that, um, so it's called luminosity distance, but the, um, so the question is their name for the fact that the farther stars appear dimmer. But the important part is that um, the distance and brightness, they're actually two things that are kind of being conflated a little bit. And I keep picking on Orion because when we get to luminosity and distance, Orion is a particularly wonderful example of this. Is really, roughly speaking, does it kind of seem like all the major stars in Orion are about the same brightness? Like none is wildly brighter than any other one. They're about the same you know, apparent brightness from planet Earth. But look at this thing this with a little epsilon on it, which I'll explain in a second. Is That's like five times farther than the star um, up in the, the right shoulder. So what does that mean about this epsilon star? Yeah, maybe it's larger, maybe it's hotter, something's going on. What I do know is how much power is it actually putting out? The total amount of light that it's emitting is tremendous compared to this one. So if two stars appear to be the same brightness, but one's much farther away, that farther one must be emitting more light. And how it's doing that and you know the actual numbers that go on it, we'll get to later. So this is a weird trick where it almost appears as though all these stars should be, roughly speaking, at the same distance, but it's really not true. And you know, it'll actually be pretty hard to just look at things in the sky and determine who's emitting more power. Yep. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, um, what is Olber's paradox? And this, uh, we'll talk about it when we get to cosmology. So in the old pre-Big Bang days, and actually up to and including well-respected scientists who were working in the 1960s, it was a legitimate idea that the universe was infinitely old. And you swept this idea about, you know, this problem with how old the universe is and where did it come from. You basically dodged the question by saying the universe is infinitely old. And then you ask, well, if the thing is infinitely old and I put a bunch of matter in a box and I let gravity work, it should collapse. So you solve that problem by saying, well, the universe is also infinitely big. So everything that's pulling me this way, there's something pulling me the opposite direction. Everything balances out. And it turns out that's actually not true, but you know, it's a very subtle point. And Olber's paradox is that if you have an infinitely big, infinitely old universe, then should there be, you know, just pick a spot on the sky. So should there be a star there? Anywhere I point to, there should be a star there. So what should the night sky really look like in an infinitely big, infinitely old universe? Blazing, bright, white, infinite light, you know? So it should be very, very against, doesn't, um, shouldn't look like what we actually see. So that's Olber's paradox. And you can just, basically, you should have been able to dismiss out of hand this infinitely old, infinitely big universe. 
and people would work on ways of you know trying to resolve these ideas. They would say that there's dust that absorbs the light and stuff like that. Or you know, if you're looking really far away, um, maybe something happens and there's some quantum effects that eat your photons or something. And they work really hard to get around this. But it's a pretty you know just basic and really tough fact about infinity is that you know, an infinitely big universe, there should be something there. Why don't I see it? So, yeah, we'll get to this when we get to cosmology, even though there's not much more to say about it than that, really. Okay. So the last thing to point out about this constellation uh, scheme is that there's, you know, especially for amateur astronomers on Earth, um, so stars have names and historical names like Aldebaran and Polaris and stuff like that. That would be really difficult to keep track of. So there's a, um, a naming scheme that goes along with the constellations, and it goes like this. So these are called Bayer designations. Is that within a given constellation, the brightest star is Alpha thingy. So the brightest star in Orion, apparently brightest from Earth, um, which I think is that and maybe that's a close second. So I know it's actually the top shoulder because I cheated and looked. So the brightest star is the alpha star. So kind of like how we do things socially. So that's alpha Orionis. That's beta Orionis. The third brightest star would be uh, delta Orionis, gamma Orionis, and then this thing, epsilon Orionis. So the names actually tell you what the brightness is. And this absolves you from having to remember all these like funny you know, names like Betelgeuse and Rigel and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so the question is, is there some, maybe the quirk about infrared light and ultraviolet light that would save us from Olber's paradox? And the answer is maybe, because if you introduce the idea of uh, Hubble's law and if you let everything expand, if things are expanding away from you, they'll be Doppler shifted. So if you've ever heard this um, effect where an ambulance drives by you or a car and the sound is high-pitched when it's coming towards you and then it drops when it goes away from you. I'm going to pretend I'm too dignified to do it, but you guys know what I mean. Okay, so if light is a wave too, so if all these galaxies are going away from me, what happens is the light is also um, Doppler shifted. So as things go away from me, and if they're going away faster, what they get is redshifted. So you can save yourself from the terrors of Olber's paradox if you have an infinitely big universe, but you let things expand. And now what the expansion and the Doppler shift does is I don't see visible light there really far away because the thing that's there got super, super redshifted. So and it's actually, that's a real effect. And you could argue that the Hubble Space Telescope has done its job because it's seeing things that are so far away that it just wouldn't be visible light anymore. And its, um, its successor, the James Webb Telescope, should be able to pick up where Hubble left off and see infrared things, so things that are super redshifted. But we don't have to worry about saving Olber's paradox anymore because if you do permit an expanding universe, well, then you also have to deal with the Big Bang. And we now know that the universe is finite in time, at least. And we can put a number on it. So, yeah, it's a very good question, though. It's like, there, you know, ultraviolet light, for instance. You know, there could be all sorts of ultraviolet things there. I just don't see it with whatever took this picture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the term redshifted is the word for what happens if I take a source of light and I move it away from me. And it's kind of a slang term because you can redshift infrared light and make it more infrared. So the term comes from the fact that at least in visible light, blue light has a shorter wavelength and red light has a longer wavelength. So to say something is redshifted, what you're saying kind of slangly is that I've increased the wavelength because the thing is running away from me that's emitting it. And to say something's blue shifted is slang for it's coming towards me so the wavelength is compressed. Good. Other questions? You guys can't wait for cosmology, huh? <laughs> yeah. There's a... So if I 
understand right is the question is, does this naming scheme, like how far does this go? So alpha, beta, gamma, da, 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 da. Is that? So the, like a, I guess the question, is there a different catalog with different light that we could use, something like aside from the celestial sphere? Yeah, in fact, astronomy is absolutely lousy with different types of catalogs. And if you're curious about X-ray sources, which are where you'd find a black hole, for instance, there are X-ray catalogs, and if you're just like a, you know, like a pedestrian amateur astronomer, this thing is a pretty good catalog for you. If you like um, star clusters and galaxies, there's an NGC catalog. And so depending on what you're curious about and what you like looking at, basically people have picked, you know, called through and made a, a particular catalog for that particular thing. So this thing, these Bayer designations, they're really for like visible light and close stars. So there's nothing in this that isn't a star and there's nothing in this that isn't, you know, at least like some reasonably at least you know affordable telescope that you could use to see it um, the question that I thought you asked and I want to answer anyway <laughs> is um, how far does this go Gesundheit is uh, so at some point you run out of Greek letters and that happens you know 88 times the number of Greek letters is not a very big number and there are many 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 stars so this thing does continue and you'll hear Famously, there's like 51 Pegasi or something like that. As you've gone all the way through all of the Greek letters, and then after that, it would be the 51st star. So it keeps going. So, yeah, people didn't realize how many stars there were when they started this idea, I think. But, yeah. So that's your first star catalog, which is nice. So you don't have to remember names now. Um, and roughly speaking, it tells you, you know, if somebody says, look at. Um, Alpha Cassiopeia or something like that, you know exactly what to look at. It's the brightest thing in Cassiopeia. So that having been said, even things that aren't bright stars, and this is not a Bayer designation, but other mysterious things also get thrown in with the constellation designation. So this mysterious point where a bunch of stars are orbiting um, nothing, what appears to be nothing, so right, right there, actually. This is Sagittarius A star, which means the most important mystery spot in the constellation Sagittarius. And the thing here that's pulling a whole bunch of stars around it, like dogs on a leash, is what, actually? You guys remember? Yeah, supermassive black hole that's 4.3 million times more massive than the sun. So, and the sun's pretty massive, 4 million times more. So this works for that too. And it's basically anything that's super bright or super important, you can get away with the um, constellation designation. So there's a little local black hole, uh, Cygnus, it might be a neutron star, I forget, Cygnus X1. So it's the first most important X-ray source in Cygnus. So this constellation idea is just very easy for very bright, very useful objects. Even if, in this case, certainly you're not looking up and seeing the black hole. Yeah, there's a, yeah, so the question is, what are the different colored dots? Uh, in this graph, there's a lot to unpack. This is a whole bunch of, I think, radio wave observations of stars right at the galactic center in the direction of Sagittarius. And each one of these color-coded dots means that was taken like year after year after year after year. So this might have even been Arecibo, which is this huge radio telescope, and you can't point this 300 meter dish at something that's just built into the side of, um, into the side of a, a valley. So you wait until it comes back and you take more observations. And what you're seeing is this star, it's a star, appears to be moving. Right? And then the star appears to be moving. And then they traced out the full orbits just based on math and Kepler's laws, which we'll get to next week. Yeah, I will animate this 
well, not me personally. I'll show you an animation of this later in the quarter where you see all of these things. And it's really wild. I mean, you're like, oh my god, those are stars. So somebody's like pulling an entire star around, and they're all orbiting. So these are pretty old, 1995, pretty old observations. And um, now the new modern ones with um, ultraviolet and infrared light, I think the infrared ones are really good, is they have like 20 stars all orbiting this point, And you can actually see them, and they kind of go like this. The way that a comet might. Um, that's kind of an open question because these orbits take, you know, like a decade or so, even for the close ones, and we just don't really have enough to. Um, so theoretically, they should. They should, you know, interact with gas and they should emit gravitational radiation and stuff like that. But honestly, it's probably not enough to see after two orbits. So you have to be really close to something really really, really large gravitationally to really be emitting um, a significant amount of your energy in gravity waves. Um, to put it in perspective, the moon is drifting away from us at like a centimeter per year or something like that. This is the same sort of effect. So it's not something you would see 28 light years from here. Yeah, 28,000. The moon? We keep the moon, so it's not going to fly away. It's got enough, there's enough gravitational potential that it's, it's stuck with us. So we'll move a little bit, especially as Earth slows down, but we're keeping the moon, barring some sort of interaction with a nasty thing out in the cosmos. Yeah. Other questions? Before September 15th, 2015, the answer was no, we don't have any direct way of determining. So all of the evidence that black holes exist was kind of like secondhand inference. You know, it's the same way that you've determined that raccoons exist. You just like wake up one morning and all your trash is gone and stuff like that, and you never see them. So same thing with black holes. And then finally, two black holes, well, actually, this apparently happens shockingly frequently. Finally, human beings built a machine that was so sensitive to gravitational radiation that it detected one black hole eating another one. And there's absolutely nothing else that it could have possibly been within any plausible theory that we have and accept. So the direct evidence of black holes based on the type of radiation that they do emit, which is gravitational radiation, was finally observed like six months ago or whatever. And we'll get to that also in a month or two. Yeah. Oh, the actual strain that the thing put on, yeah. Yeah, so if you were standing even remotely close to these two inspiling black holes, the gravitational radiation would have like ripped you apart. Um, the amount of energy that they released in total would be equivalent to making like a nuclear bomb about you know maybe eight times the mass of the sun. It was like totally absurd, right? Um, by the time it got to Earth, 1.4 billion light years distant, it was enough to move two arms of a very delicate experimental apparatus, which is like four kilometers long by the width of a proton or something like that. So, yes, yeah, so it wasn't, it was like a fabulously sensitive measurement, actually. Yeah, but part of that is the fact that it was very far away when it happened. Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about gravitational waves. Unless you guys want to talk more about it, then we'll talk more about it, because I like talking about gravitational waves. And um, when we talk about telescopes. Good. OK. So the other thing that constellations do is they let us talk very locally within the uh, solar system itself about directions. And remember this, say, fraudulent picture. Don't, sun's not really in Aquarius on February 21st. Um, so I don't know why they didn't update this. This is from the the textbook itself. So if we want to talk about which direction we're heading in, and you know, I know at February 21st, we're zooming off tangent to the circle, about 31 kilometers per second. This would be in the direction of Libra. And then if you want to talk about a comet that's you know, also really close to us, you can talk about the direction that it's traveling in terms of this background of stars, too. So it works for all of these things. 
And there's really nothing better for just like rough estimates. Okay. Okay. So there's another way of calculating things if we want to be more precise. Um, but before we do that, we actually almost have it. So there's a correspondence in between this fictitious celestial sphere and Earth itself. So we have this wonderful scheme on planet Earth for finding locations to dazzling precision if you really want to do it, if you're like a geocacher. But it relies on some landmarks. And some of these landmarks we get to keep. So go to the North Pole and shine a laser pointer directly over your head. Um, you're basically marking out the North Pole on Earth. But you're also marking out what we'll call the North Celestial Pole. And that's basically like where Polaris lives. So shine this laser pointer directly north and you'll be lighting up Polaris. You won't really be lighting up Polaris. Um, but that's the North Celestial Pole. Same thing at the Southern Pole, South Celestial Pole. What's the nice thing about the North and South Celestial Poles? What is it that their motion does or doesn't do as observed from Earth? And why they're wonderfully special points? They don't seem to move over the course of hours, days. That's exactly right. So um, precession will change things. So we didn't always have a North Star, actually. So the other thing we can do is that was really useful. We can extend Earth's equator, like just take the equator like you know it, the normal Earthy equator, and we can extend that out. And that's what's called the celestial equator. So we basically have mapped parts of you know, our, our um, earthly geography onto the sky. And then we also know we have these um, chunks that we can carve it into constellations. So we're almost there. And those are landmarks on the celestial sphere at this point. Although never forget that it's totally fictitious. OK. So what is the thing that lets me specify something on Earth, at least, with dazzling arbitrarily good precision. So anybody who's ever like geocached something or used a GPS doesn't tell you Texas, right? It doesn't give you like a city or a state. It tells you what. Yeah, coordinates, latitude and longitude. And this is nice because you, know, you want to say you're in Miami, you could say 26 degrees north, uh, 80 degrees west. But if you want to know where you know the best Cuban sandwiches in Miami are, you could say 26.43287 north and 80.10532 west, and you can make this as precise as possible, like down to you know, depending on how many digits you use, down to you know the centimeter or something like that. For things that aren't bright and aren't obvious, this will be what astronomers need to do for like kind of dim astronomy or precision astronomy. And of the billions of very like faint stars of one particular spectral type in the galaxy, if you want to look at one specific one, you have to do better than constellations. So basically what we want is space latitude and space longitude. And space latitude is pretty easy because we have the equivalent of the markers for latitude. So what latitude is is how high above the equator you are. And 90 degrees north is the North Pole, and 90 degrees south is the South Pole. We have a celestial equator. We have a celestial north and south pole. They're very convenient because they mark out as special points as you can get. We'll keep them. So the celestial equator is the point of zero, what we'll call declination. So that's kind of space latitude. 90 degrees north is 90 degrees north. 90 degrees south is 90 degrees south declination. It's basically that is latitude. Um, so latitude is to declination, and then the equivalent of longitude is something with a funny name and funny units and a problem because we don't have a Greenwich mean in the sky. Um, that's what's called right ascension. So it's like an equivalent idea. So if you understand latitude, longitude, it's just the space version of that is declination, right ascension. The right ascension will make sense to you um, once you get the units. So it basically tells you how long it will take something to come across the sky and be above your head. So um, I don't know if the right means like literally left, right, right, but it basically tells you stuff about how long it'll take something to be over your head. So that's the ascension part. Um, and declination, um, I don't know. It's probably Latin for height above something. But it's good that they chose different words, though. Although I would have preferred space latitude and space longitude. They didn't ask me. OK. So these we have. And these are two pictures of 90 degrees north declination, 
and 90 degrees south declination. So this point is 90 degrees north declination on the sky. Remember, we're talking about locating stuff on the sky. And something about here, what would that be? 85, I agree, sure. What about that? 70, I don't know, 65? Sounds good. OK. So the problem is that it's everything within that circle is all the same declination. So we've got to get the other coordinate. And then this point, this is Peru again. So that point is 90 degrees south declination. And that would be maybe like 75 degrees south declination and 60 degrees south declination. But the problem is, is we need two numbers, because everything within that circle of trails is at the same declination. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. So the other question is just to make sure we're not we're doing the accounting right. Is you measure latitude and uh, in degrees, 90 north to 90 south, zero at the equator. You measure declination in degrees, zero at the celestial equator, 90 at the north celestial pole, um, minus 90 or 90 south at the south celestial pole. So what we need is the right ascension, right? So we need the equivalent of, um, of longitude. And longitude is weirdly arbitrary, right? So on Earth, how do you start longitude? What's zero longitude? So the longitude are the slices like this, so the north-south ones. And see, this is the problem, is like the one natural place on Earth is the equator. So everybody agrees on what the equator is. What's the special point for these slices? Is there really any special point? So Antarctica, somewhere down there. What I'm looking for is like one of these that makes the most sense. And I think I heard the answer, which is like an unsatisfying answer, is the people who are the most, like, I don't know, well disposed to just basically impose their will upon the world about what they thought the center of longitude should be. English, right? So, <laughs> um, you know, a, a choice had to be made. Again, there's no special point. So we all, you know, we all know what it means to be at the North Pole and the South Pole as the world spins directly around me, and that's very cool. And the equator, everybody would know what that means. All the stars come and rise and set. There's not a circumpolar one in sight. But this is completely arbitrary, right? So there's nothing special about any of these lines. For any of these lines, the sun is over high in the sky at noon and all the way down at midnight. So there's nothing that distinguishes any of these lines, any line of longitude. So basically, somebody had to pick it. And the people who were, you know, the, picked it and we kept their idea was the English. So the line that connects the North Pole to the South Pole and runs through Greenwich, England, which is on the west side of London, is the starting point for right ascension. So basically, we need to pick space Greenwich, England. And there's no real reason to. Um, there is, it's actually nice. So there's a better space Greenwich, England than there is a Greenwich, England. But this is it. So this is, this. you can just tell how foolishly arbitrary it is. I wanted to find one picture, I think, when I did this. So I image search Greenwich Prime Meridian. And I like the fact that every single person you see, they all have the same idea of, oh, I'm in the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere, and everybody's straddling it and think they came up with the idea. Um, but it's like completely arbitrary, right? So one foot in the Eastern Hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere, there's nothing special about this place. Okay. Yeah, totally. I will admit that I went to Four Corners, and we actually had to break in. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, it's just silly, right? So it's a choice. OK. Here's the neat thing, though, is that there is a little bit of an asymmetry in two celestial motions that tells us that we can narrow our choice down from you know, any of the infinite number of places to start it. There are four pretty good choices to make. There is a special spot, two special spots, really, on the celestial equator. And they have to do with the fact that the Earth is tilted out of the plane around which it orbits the sun. So this is showing us from like, you know, the preferred plane is the north and south pole are straight up and down. And it appears as though the orbit of, um, you know, the apparent orbit of the sun around the Earth, we're actually orbiting the sun, never forget it. This appears to be shifted by 23 and a half degrees. What's really going on is, you know, the 
sun is sitting in there and then we're orbiting it and our axial tilt happens to be 23 and a half degrees. So what appears to happen from Earth in the sky is that sometimes the sun is high, summer, sometimes the sun is low in the sky, winter, and at two special points the sun appears right along the celestial equator. So right on the spring and the fall equinox the sun either plunges down through the celestial equator or pops up. So why don't we pick that as space Greenwich, England? And why don't we run a line from celestial North Pole through this point? We pick the spring equinox. I guess it's a little bit more optimistic. And then to the south celestial pole. So this is the prime meridian. So that's where we'll basically separate, start our counting of space longitude, AKA right ascension. Okay. This, yeah, the, yeah, the blue ring is the celestial equator. So you can, you know, if you can see the really fine detail of this, there's the actual Earth's equator, and the blue plane is the celestial equator, and then the sun, sun-colored golden one is the plane of our orbit around the sun, and because of our tilt, they're not the same thing. So the equator and the plane that makes up the orbit are off. Acts, or they're tilted by 23 and a half degrees. So, you know, this is why we have seasons, right? So the sun is high in the sky and low in the sky, and then at two points it kind of like picks special spots along the celestial equator. And it's going to vary a zero of right ascension. So we're going to pick the spring one, the vernal equinox, and this is how it looks from Earth. And the sun doesn't necessarily need to be there. It's not a time, it's now a place is that the location of the spring equinox, so not time, but the place, the spring equinox, is defined to be the place that the sun would be on that day. So as the sun travels against the background of stars, as it makes it through all of the zodiac signs over the course of 12 months, on you know March 23rd or whatever, it'll be right there. So this is a point on the sky called the spring equinox. And likewise, there's a point on the sky, Gesundheit, in the constellation Virgo, which is the fall equinox. There's a point in Sagittarius called the winter solstice and a point in the ankle of Gemini called the summer solstice. So these are special points, and we'll pick this as like space Greenwich mean. So this is what we'll call zero right ascension. And this is what we'll call 12 hours right ascension. And I'll explain the units in a second. But does that make sense? OK. Um, the thing to keep in the back of your mind, and I'll sh show you, yeah, I know, it ruins everything. Um, I'll show you the effect of this is that, well, these things shift. Again, we have this precession of the Earth, and you know, spring isn't always spring. So now we're pointing towards the sun and in the middle of summer, and 13,000 years at the same location of orbit, because we precess, it'll be pointed the other way. So what that means from a practical standpoint is the location of the spring and fall equinoxes and the solstices, they'll actually shift really slowly over the course of basically 2,000 years to get from there to there. So you guys don't care because you're not going to live for 2,000 years. But if you're doing hyper-precise astronomy, you do care about this. So what you'll see is the spring equinox will always have like a um, a tagline on it that says the spring equinox as it was in January 1st, 1950, or 2000, or something like that. And I'll just show you this. It's not, it's not necessarily important from a practical standpoint. Okay, so we, excellent. We have our Greenwich mean for space. So zero thingies right ascension is where the, so this is the path of the sun through the celestial sphere, high in the sky, summer, low in the sky, winter, and then right there is the spring equinox. So boom, that's the line. So the way that we're going to do reckoning with this is we use degrees for latitude on Earth. We're not going to do that for the sky, because from a practical standpoint, there's a better way for astronomers to do this. How long does it take for the celestial sphere to make a full rotation? So you pick some star, and then how long later does it take for the star to come directly back overhead? 24 hours. So the natural and easy and useful thing to do, even though it feels a little bit weird at first, is we're not going to measure um, right ascension in degrees. We're going to measure it in hours. Yeah. So this is 24 hours is a full trip around. From this line, 
that goes through the spring equinox to this line that would go through the fall equinox. That would be 12 hours. This would be 6 hours. This would be 18 hours. This would be 23 hours. And then you can subdivide, as we do, hours into minutes, and then minutes into seconds, and then you can put a decimal point on seconds, and you can make it as precise as you'd like. But this is really nice, because without even like thinking about it and without doing any conversions in between the two things, is I could say that I'm looking at something, and I look up its position, and it's at like four hours right ascension. And then I want to look at something else, and that something else is at seven hours right ascension is that gives me three hours to look at the first thing. And I don't have to think any more than that if I'm actually plotting out a night of observing. So it really quickly tells you like the time differences in between when things will be visible. So that's why people do it. Just remember that it's weird. And there will be one or two questions on the exercise. OK. So here's a little bit of practice. Um, this is part of the flattened out celestial sphere. So this is just the springy part, I guess. And this is what's called the ecliptic. That's the plane in, through which the sun travels over the course of half a year in this case. There's the celestial equator, south and north celestial poles. Um, let's locate this star. So I think this is, uh, oh, so that's actually the Andromeda galaxy. So where is the Andromeda galaxy using these hyper fancy precise coordinates, so that thing? So what I need is declination and right ascension. So the right ascension is about 50 minutes, right? Good. So this is zero. So zero hours, one hour, two hours. And it's a little bit closer to, yeah, so. 50 minutes or so, so we'll call it zero hours, 50 minutes, just to put everything in. And this is approximate. Right? Does it make sense where the right ascension came from? Okay. And then declination for Andromeda, what's that? Ooh, we have descension, some say 42, some say 36. Um, so yeah, I think part of it is like, how are these marked out? So that's, the equator is zero. That's 10, so the numbers appear above the lines. So 20, 30, 40, this appears slightly above 40. So 42, I think, is pretty good. So declination, 42 degrees. Good. So what you could do is you could tell your friend that, you know, hey, you should check out the Andromeda galaxy. It's going to kill us um, in 4 billion years. You should look zero minutes right ascension, sorry, zero hours, 50 minutes, right ascension, 42 degrees declination. And they would be able north, and they would be able to just point right there. And that would be precise enough for them to locate it, actually. Okay. Yeah, there are two ways of doing it. Is you can either plus for north and minus for south, or north and south. Um, yeah, I think that, I actually have no idea what's more common. I think maybe you see north more. OK. So it worth having another bit of practice or make sense? So this is the hard one, actually, especially if you have to construct the coordinate system yourself. Good. OK. So the thing that you get, actually, is, and this won't be true for the third way of measuring stuff, is as well as this being arbitrarily precise, everybody agrees on it. Every single person agrees on the fact that Polaris is at the North Celestial Pole, and you know the same stars appear to spin around the South Celestial Pole. You know, you and your fictitious friend in Moscow, unless you actually have a friend in Moscow, um, you'll agree on all of these landmarks. You'll agree on the fact that the sun appears to be there on the spring equinox. You would create the same exact right ascension and declination scheme. So this is also universal, as well as being precise. And every astronomer agrees on the right ascension and declination of every object no matter where they are and when they're looking. So that's very nice. OK. This is how it works in practice. So this is the Wikipedia article from our friend Sagittarius A star. And they're telling you, look, there is a supermassive black hole. This is, you know, we'll get to this stuff later, but this is where you would go and look for it if you were so bold as to think you could see it. So it's in the constellation Sagittarius. Its right ascension is 17 hours, 45 minutes, and 40.0409 seconds. It's 
So it's very precise, right? And its declination, this is negative, so it's in the southern hemisphere, minus 29 degrees, and then zero hours, uh, 28 point da -da 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 -da, uh, minutes. So that's what the tags mean. Bad. And you could put another digit of precision on this. Oh, yeah. So the last thing is this. So what on earth are these epochs? So what that equinox or epoch means is these numbers only make sense, well, this number only makes sense in the context of knowing when exactly that spring equinox was. So you'll see J2000 or J1950. That really just corrects for the slight processional effect where these two things actually move a little bit, you know, constellation sign every 2,000 years or so. But, you know, again, nothing you'll ever do in this class requires that. So it's just mostly curiosity. Good. You guys going to go observe Sagittarius A star this evening? Good luck. Uh, so any questions about that? Okay. So method three, um, and this is how things would work if you actually were to do some um, observational astronomy, we'll just do it there, is really just use your own personal frame of reference and a compass to locate stuff. The problem is, you know, let's say it's dark or whatever, you can't just say, like, it's over there. So you have to basically map out your own personal coordinate system. And to you personally, directly over your head is your zenith. To you personally, the stuff that's about to disappear over the horizon is, that line is called the horizon. And then the compass points are, you know, what a normal person would call direction, if you come from a military tradition or navigation, tend to call this like azimuth, just means northeast, southwest. And the last thing you need is the altitude. So in between these, you can specify things to arbitrary precision if you'd like. So you could say, you know, 20 degrees north of east, turn your body 20 degrees north of east. And then you could say 45 degrees altitude. You would tilt your head up from the horizon 45 degrees. And that, you know, somebody's on the other side of a tree and you can't tell them to point and look at that. You could just yell, yell direction or azimuth and altitude and they would turn and look. So this is how you find a UFO in the woods. And here's something that demonstrates that in a non-static way. Um, so this puts a degree number on azimuth. So it's 140 degrees you know, clockwise from north. And you can just change this. So higher azimuth means higher and higher towards your zenith. And then lower azimuth means da -da 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 -da. so negative would be below your horizon. Can't see it. But right at zero would be at your horizon. So the limit of what you can see is the horizon. And then lastly, your personal meridian, which is a little bit confusing, is what separates your east from your west. So the prime meridian is what separates the world's east from the world's west. But then you've got one yourself. So everything to the, in this case, the left of this person's meridian is east. And everything to the right of their meridian is west. So it's like yours. And it's not necessarily wonderfully important. You can get away with altitude and azimuth and specify anything you want to whatever precision you'd like. What's that? The nadir? The nadir is the anti-azimuth. So it's the point there that if the Earth swallowed you up, you would fall towards it. So that's the nadir. So you're having like the worst day on Earth. Has anybody ever said, like, this is the nadir of my existence? Yeah, that's what it means. It's the lowest of the low points. Has anybody ever said this is the zenith of your existence? Yeah, it's good, right? It means that everything is downhill from that point. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, so the way that this shows up in um, practice is these things called sky charts. And these are the practical things that you would take out to look at pretty things in the sky on a clear night. And um, the thing about them is they require local information. You need to tell me when you're going out and when you're using it. So this is, you know, as this indicates, this is a winter sky chart. So I see Orion up. And the same sky chart would not be applicable in the summer. And this also requires me to know where I'm looking. So this is basically pretty close to Seattle, I think. Maybe this is like Seattle at 10 p.m. in December or something like that. So that's what I would have to tell you. OK, altitude and azimuth. So the first thing to notice is one thing. Is this a screwed up picture? There's something funny about it if you look at the the coordinates. 
What's that? The artistic part? Yeah, and you'll actually see this sometimes. People will paint beyond the horizon to indicate what you can't see. Um, so this would be the horizon, so the limit of everything that you can see at the edge. And if you look at the compass points, too, there's another thing that's a little bit funny. East and west are flipped. Does they make a mistake? So it has to, that's probably, um, maybe I'm misunderstanding how you're phrasing it, is the, yeah, the appearance part is exactly right. So it's another way of phrasing it, I think, and a little bit more to the point is, what's the difference in between a ground map where your intuition about where east and west should be versus a sky chart? So the map you hold down and it describes the earth below you. What are you doing with this? Yeah, so that's, it's not necessarily the motion, but it's the fact that the celestial sphere is above you. So, you know, have north, sorry, have west and east and north and south, if I lift it up, two of those things need to be flipped. So we could have flipped north and south, but people traditionally flip east and west. Because you're using this like this, two of the compass points need to be flipped. Right. So this is not a, a mistake. East and west are flipped on sky charts. Does that make sense? This is why we do exercise two, is that the like beating your head into this geometry is actually really fun. So exercise two is the one that would probably cause you a headache because of all the visualization of funny stuff. OK, so the snowman wants to tell the uh, guy with green gloves where Beetlejuice is using local coordinates. What would he say? To Beetlejuice. Oh, so the horizon is, is this. So this is all the stuff that's visible. So it's, it's weird, it's like a fisheye view. So if there were like buildings and trees, all the buildings and trees would be around there. So it's not like, you know, it's not like a, uh, a distance-wise accurate depiction of the sky. It's the entire dome of the sky kind of flattened into 2D. So Beetlejuice is, so the two things I need are altitude and azimuth. And the easiest way to do it, I think, is the other way around is what direction should I turn myself? I should turn myself south. And then how far should I lift up my head? 45 degrees? Sounds good. Okay. Where's the zenith? Sure, yeah. The other way of saying it is the zenith is the center of this. If you imagine this to be your view through a gun sight or something like that, the crosshairs would be the zenith. So the edge of what you can see is your horizon. That's your western horizon where some trees and buildings would be. That would be your southern horizon where mountains might be. This is your zenith, right at the crosshairs. Your meridian would be a straight line down through the center. And if I want to see Beetlejuice, I would turn my body in the direction of south, and I would lift my head. So that would be 90 degrees up, maybe like 45 degrees up. I think that's reasonable. We should do one more. So the beehive is a pretty adorable looking cluster in the constellation of Cancer. Um, and you know, the snowman wants to tell the green gloves guy where Beehive is, but he doesn't know it's in constellation Cancer. So what should he say? So 30 degrees up is all of this stuff. The second piece of information is you got to say what? Turn east and then lift your head by like 30, 40 degrees. Good. Does that make sense? Okay. I think it's a trick question because snowmen don't talk. Okay. Um, same thing. There's the Andromeda constellation. The Andromeda galaxy is over here, like here-ish. If I wanted to tell somebody where to look, I would say, in this particular circumstance, at this time, from this place, I would say, point yourself kind of west to northwest and lift your head up about 25 degrees. And you might have a chance of seeing the Andromeda galaxy. It's basically at the limit of human vision. So that's local. Okay. 
questions about that? There's a, maybe people have better vision than I do, or like the Earth's atmosphere has been polluted since ancient times, but I think it's a little bit, you have to know exactly what to do. And if you, at least if I look directly at the Andromeda galaxy, I don't see it. Because there's also a cable of nerves that's plugged into the back of your eye, so you have this kind of little bit of a dead spot there. If you look a little bit away from the Andromeda galaxy, kind of at the periphery of your vision, you see this really large, hazy, bright spot there. And during a really clear winter night when Andromeda is really high in the sky, um, the, you, usually it's called Andromeda, but the easiest way to find it is look at Cassiopeia. And if you look at this kind of part of the M, it's about this far away. So you just follow that dimple down. But you have to kind of look off to the side, and you see it out of the periphery of your vision. And then you get excited because you see it, so you look at it, and then it disappears. Um, but yeah, I'm. So I'm not like a good enough. I tried my hand at some of this stuff once, and the patience, and like the optical effects, and the, um, you know, the. Stuff like the ocular blind spot and jitters and this kind of like target blindness that happens. So a lot of what people do is um, you look for stars disappearing across the lunar limb or as an asteroid passes in front of them, which is kind of insane. And there are these weird things where you're like looking at a star and it disappears and it takes you like five seconds to notice that it disappears. So they have all sorts of like clever tricks to deal with this stuff. The most I've done is just put a CCD at the end of a... Uh, telescope and then had the computer be patient for me. It's about the limit of, you know, <laughs> what I do. But yeah. Guys that go out the backyard and... Yeah, it used to be uh, comet hunters and it's a little bit sad. I think that um, there's this golden age of amateur astronomy and even with like Hubble Space Telescope and stuff like that. You know, Shoemaker Levy 9, that comet was discovered by you know, people just literally out in their backyard and stuff like that. It's pretty close to, you know, like, I hope it doesn't really happen and it'll always be fun to look at stuff, but that area is almost done because people are making these telescopes that just take pictures mechanically and map the entire sky on autopilot and slew around, and then they compare it to the same thing the next night and compare it to the same thing the next night, and no fleet of humans can compete with that. So it'll always be fun to look, I think, but you know the the time when it was equally likely that especially something in the solar system that was new was discovered by an amateur or a professional, I think is pretty close to done, sadly. We should still buy a telescope. It's kind of fun. They're actually weirdly cheap. Um, it's like a thousand or two bucks for a reasonably good one. I don't know if that's really that cheap. Um, okay. So this is, in summary, is you have three ways of pointing in astronomy. One, if it's really bright and you don't, you know, everybody on Earth will, would agree on it, uh, or it's really distinctive. You can just say, like, it's in Perseus or something like that, in the constellation, in Ursa Major. Um, two is this universal celestial coordinate, so declination and right ascension. So if you give me declination and right ascension with the funny units on right ascension, you can be arbitrarily precise and everybody agrees. And as well as that, you should kind of know the landmarks of the uh, celestial sphere. And then finally, with these local coordinates, and that's just for like, you know, you and your friend in your backyard. And what they won't do is if you say, you know, you call up your friend in Moscow again, and you say, I just saw something amazing. It's due west of me at 30 degrees above my horizon. It's not where it is for them. So local coordinates really does mean something. So any questions about that stuff? OK. This and the projection of 3D stuff onto curved 2D of the celestial sphere, and then finally onto a 2D piece of paper, and plotting out what would happen in the future, this is a, this is a skill that you have to practice. And it's a little bit, um, I always do this. Um, and it can make your head hurt a little bit, so ask as many questions as you possibly can.